So in this chapter, we'll cover the peripheral nervous system, which is going to contain the spinal nerves and the cranial nerves, and then some other details regarding receptors and things of that nature. So if you look on this flow chart, you can see that the peripheral nervous system has a sensory division and a motor division. And the motor division is divided between the somatic nervous system, which we'll cover in this chapter, and the autonomic nervous system, which may, is made up of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. And we'll cover that in the next chapter. So sensory receptors are specialized to respond to changes in their environment, right? So to respond to stimuli. And when you activate the sensory receptors, it results in greater potentials and those greater potentials could trigger nerve impulses, which is the action potential in a nerve. We have different classifications of receptors. If we classify them according to, according to stimulus type, we have mechanoreceptors, which respond to touch, pressure, vibration, stretch, and itch. We have thermoreceptors. We think thermo, we think heat, so, or, or actually just think temperature, I should say, because uh, respond to changes in temperature, cold or heat. Photoreceptors, we're gonna have respond to light energy. So an example of photoreceptors would be in the retina. Chemoreceptors, which we've talked about a little bit, I believe, and we'll talk about a lot in the future in Anatomy 202, um, they respond to chemicals. Uh, examples would be smell, taste, changes in blood chemistry, sodium levels, hormone levels, things like that. We picked up by these receptors called chemoreceptors. Nociceptors, uh, sensitive to pain stimuli. So it could be excessive pressure, inflammatory chemicals. It could also be extreme heat or cold. So thermoreceptors respond to temperature changes, but the extreme heat or cold would stimulate nociceptors. Now, if we classify receptors according to location, we have exteroreceptors. These are ones that respond to stimuli outside the body. So there's receptors on the skin for touch and pressure. We talked about in the skin chapter, even for pain, uh, for temperature. Um, and most special sense organs are going to be classified as exteroreceptors. Interoreceptors are also called visceral receptors. Remember, viscera means organ. And so these are going to respond to stimuli re, uh, arising from inside the body in the internal viscera or organs uh, and the blood vessels. Uh, these are sensitive to chemical changes, tissue stretch, temperature changes as well, but from the inside. Third, we have proprioceptors. These respond to stretch in the muscles, tendons, joints, and ligaments, as well as connective tissues. And they're gonna inform the brain of one's movements. A lot of times I say the proprioceptors kind of give you an idea of your position in space because they're giving input from these joints and ligaments, tendons, and muscles. And, uh, you know, basically telling the brain, you know, where you are in space and informing you of, you know, the movement uh, and location you know, the body parts are at, at any given time. Now, if we classify according to structural complexity, you have complex receptors, which are your special sense organs. So you got vision, hearing, equilibrium, smell, and taste. Simple receptors are gonna be things like tactile sensations. So touch, pressure, stretch, vibration, temperature, pain, things like that. Unencapsulated, free, or encapsulated dendritic endings are also classified under these simple receptors. So let's talk about unencapsulated dendritic endings. You have thermoreceptors that fall under this category. Cold receptors um, and heat receptors. And the cold receptors are more superficial in the dermis where the heat receptors are deeper. Another type of unencapsulated dendritic ending is the nociceptors. These are the ones we said are for pain. So respond to pinching, chemicals uh, from damaged tissue, temperatures that are extreme. We said extreme hot, extreme cold. And then we also have some light touch receptors under this category, uh, the Merkel discs, which we mentioned in the, uh, in as the integumentary chapter, as well as hair follicle receptors. Encapsulated dendritic endings are all mechanoreceptors. So the different types of mechanoreceptors, we've got Meissner's corpuscles, which we also saw, saw and, and Pacinian corpuscles. We saw both of those in the integumentary system. We said that Meissner's corpuscles are for light touch and Pacinian corpuscles are for deep pressure. Uh, they're also for maybe vibration. Raffini endings, this one we haven't seen before, this is for deep continuous pressure. Muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, we'll be talking about more at the end of the chapter when we talk about reflexes, but the muscle spindles respond to muscle stretch, and the Golgi tendon organs respond to stretch of the tendon. And lastly, we have joint kinesthetic receptors, which is the stretch in the articular capsules. An important differentiation is to understand the difference in, of uh, the terminology sensation versus perception. Sensation is the awareness of changes in the internal and external environment. Perception is the actual conscious interpretation of those stimuli. Now when we talk about sensory integration, 
we're talking about three levels here. We have the receptor level where we have sensory receptors. We have the circuit level where we have ascending pathways. And then we have the perceptual level where the neural circuits uh, in their cerebral cortex. And so let's look at a picture of this. So we can see the receptor, we can see the ascending pathway, right? The sensory pathway going up and into the cerebral cortex where it's gonna be processed. Now, when we talk about adaptation of sensory receptors, that's the change in sensitivity in the presence of a constant stimulus. So uh, receptor membranes become less responsive uh, as they adapt and receptor potentials decline in frequency or just stop altogether. All right, so we have two types of adaptation uh, receptors, phasic or fast adapting receptors. Examples of that would be receptors for pressure, touch, and smell. So they adapt very fast, right? Um, think about like if you walk into a room, right? So you start cooking garlic, you smell a lot of garlic, right? And then after a little bit, you don't smell it. But then if you walk out of the room and come back in, boom, you smell the garlic again, right? So what happened when you were stand, standing in the room with that smell, you adapted to it. Tonic receptors adapt very slowly or not at all. An example of this are pain receptors and then most proprioceptors. So it's important. Think your proprioceptors give you a position here in space. Well, it's important to always know where you're at, right? So you don't want to adapt to those. Uh, nociceptors, these pain receptors also, we don't want to adapt to pain receptors because we want to be able to get that pain stimulus so that we know to, you know, if the hand is, you know, on a stove, we know to remove the hand from that heat that's causing pain. Now we look at the structure of a nerve. We've got um, these coverings of the nerve. The endoneurium is going to cover the axon and the myelin sheath. The perineurium is going to be around the fascicles, which is the bundle of fibers. And then the epineurium is going to be around the entire nerve. And you can see each of those here, the endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. So we get a visualization of each of those. Now most nerves are, are mixed uh, nerves and they have both afferent, which is the sensory fibers, and efferent, which are the motor fibers. And so we have somatic afferent and somatic efferent. Then we have visceral afferent and visceral efferent. These are the different types of nerves. Um, peripheral nerves can either be cranial nerves, which will cover those, or spinal nerves. We mentioned in a previous chapter that ganglia are uh, nerve cell bodies that are grouped together, or groupings of nerve cell bodies. And uh, we'll see a dorsal root ganglia in lab and also in the pictures in this chapter. Now, when we talk about regeneration of nerve fibers, we know that neurons are amitotic. That means they don't undergo mitosis. If the body of the neuron, which is called the soma, if that gets damaged, then the axon will not regenerate. However, if it, is, if it remains intact, the axon can regenerate. And there's a number, number of things that have to happen. We need macrophages to remove the debris. We need the Schwann cells to form a regeneration tube. Uh, and they also secrete growth factors to help, help kind of regenerate that axon. And then the uh, axons regenerate. In the central nervous system, however, oligodendrocytes, which make the myelin sheath, have growth inhibiting proteins. And that prevents the central nervous system fibers from regenerating. So if we sum it up, central, uh, central nervous system nerves do not, or, you know, or fibers do not regenerate, whereas peripheral nervous system fibers do regenerate as long as the body remains intact. We'll run through these really quick. The first picture, you can see the axon becoming fragmented. This picture shows the macrophages coming to clean out that dead debris. This picture is showing uh, the Schwann cell producing that regeneration tube that I mentioned earlier. And then lastly, we get the regeneration uh, of the axon and the new myelin sheath. Now there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves and um, you know, they're Roman numerals one through 12. Uh, there's a mnemonic, there's a number of mnemonics. So the, one of the ones in your textbook is on occasion, our rusty truck acts funny, very good vehicle anyhow. You can pick whatever mnemonic you like for remembering the names of the cranial nerves. Um, and again, you're taking the first letter of each to help you know the first letter of the cranial nerve. Now, there's another mnemonic that I really, really like, and it's gonna be very helpful for you, especially for testing purposes. It tells you whether they're sensory or motor. And it's this, some say marry money, but my brother says bad business, marry money. Now, 
The S is for sensory, the M is for motor, and the B is for both sensory and motor. So it will tell you, you know, if you say some say marry money, that's the fourth, right? So some say marry money, that's the fourth cranial nerve, it's motor, right? The fifth cranial nerve is butt, so B, that's both sensory and motor. So it's an easy way to remember which cranial nerves are sensory, which are motor, and which are both sensory and motor. Now we have our mnemonic to remember this, but this shows you the names of the cranial nerves, whether they're sensory, motor, or whether they are both. All right, let's go through each of the cranial nerves. The first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. This is cranial nerve one. It is sensory, and it, uh, it controls sense of smell. Now, a, a d damage to this nerve would cause anosmia. Remember, A means without, so this is a partial or total loss of smell. Uh, some things that can cause anosmia uh, would be fracture of the ethmoid bone or lesions of these olfactory fibers. The optic nerve is cranial nerve two. This is sensory also, and its function is vision. Now some defects we would have, anopsias uh, are visual defects. Uh, if you damage the optic nerve, it causes blindness in that eye. If you damage the optic tract, it causes partial blindness. I'm gonna show you why on the next slide. If you look here on this picture, you can see the optic tracts and they cross over at the optic chiasm or optic chiasma and then become the optic nerves. Now if you look, the optic nerves actually have a component of both uh, optic tracts because it crosses over or part of it crosses over. So if you were to cut the optic tract, you only get partial loss. But if you cut the optic nerve, right, because then you still have the optic tract from the other side contributing. But if you cut the optic nerve, you're cutting both contributions to that eye. So you get complete vision loss in that particular eye. Cranial nerve three is the oculomotor nerve. Now, it, it kind of tells you in the name, right? This is motor. What are the functions? Well, there's a number of functions here. We have raising the eyelid. There are four movements of the eyeball. They're called extrinsic movements. There are six of them, but four of the six are controlled by this cranial nerve. It also constricts the iris. It controls the shape of the lens. Now, if you were to have paralysis of this nerve, it would result in potentially drooping of the eyelid, double vision, external strabismus, which is where the eyes rotate laterally. Cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve. And again, these are pairs of nerves, right? So I don't know if I've said that before, but these are pairs of cranial nerves. And so that's why it says the trochlear nerves. And these are motor. Now this is going to direct the eyeball in one of the extrinsic eye movements. It's actually gonna make the, move, the eye move out and down, so inferior and laterally. Cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve, is the largest of the cranial nerves, and it has three divisions. It has the ophthalmic division, which is sensory, the maxillary division, which is also sensory, and then the mandibular division, which is motor, to the muscles of mastication. Remember, mastication means chewing. And so if you were to, so there's a, there's a disorder called tictilaru or trigeminal neuralgia, and this is an inflammation of this cranial nerve five, this trigeminal nerve. It can cause stabbing pain, and uh, that pain can last for seconds or it can last up to a minute, uh, but it can also occur many, many times a day, uh, potentially hundreds of times a day. Now I do wanna show you this picture. The pictures are in there for you to reference in your, your PowerPoints, but I wanna pull this picture so you can see the, 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 you know, the first, second, and third divisions here. You can see on that picture all the way to the right, okay? So you can see the ophthalmic, the maxillary, mandibular divisions, and kind of their distribution. The abducens nerve, this is cranial nerve six. This is, all, this is also motor and it um, innervates the lateral rectus muscle which moves the eyes laterally. So if you were to have paralysis of this nerve, they would not move laterally. What would happen, they would deviate inward. So this results in cross eyes. That's called internal strabismus. So in this picture we see the oculomotor paralysis that we mentioned with the eye deviating laterally and then also the cross eyes with the abducens, abducens nerve paralysis on the bottom picture. Cranial nerve seven, uh, these are the facial nerves, parafacial nerves. They have both motor and sensory function. The, the motor function of the facial nerves, facial expression, um, also controls the lacrimal and salivary glands. So salivary glands uh, to secrete salivary juices and enzymes. The lacrimal glands are tears and sensory function for the facial nerves, it's taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Facial nerve damage or paralysis would, be, uh, would result in Bell's palsy, and 
this causes paralysis of facial muscles, drooping of the eyelids, sagging of the mouth on the same side, which can actually affect speech as well. And also you get dry eye syndrome, the eyes can't completely close. This is usually caused by herpes simplex one, and it usually resolves on its own, so it's usually self-limiting. This picture shows you the five divisions of the facial nerve. Now the vestibular cochlear nerve is cranial nerve eight. And there's, there's two parts of this. You have the, um, the, the cochlear division, which is responsible for hearing, and the equilibrium, or the vestibular division, which is responsible for equilibrium. And this is sensory function. So if you damage the cochlear portion, uh, that would result in you know, hearing loss, right? So deafness. If you damage the vestibular portion, it can result in dizziness, loss of balance, vomiting, nausea, also even rapid eye movements, because again, this, this division controls equilibrium receptors. And here I just pulled this up so you can see the vestibular and cochlear portion of cranial nerve eight. Cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerves, these are, have both motor and sensory functions. The motor portion of cranial nerve nine is um, uh, nerving the tongue, a part of the tongue for swallowing and uh, parasympathetic fibers to the parotid salivary gland. And so that salivary, this, this gland, these extrinsic glands called parotid salivary glands, they're one of three extrinsic groups or pairs of glands, and they secrete salivary amylase for digestion of carbohydrates. Now the sensory portion of cranial nerve nine is the taste to the posterior one third of the tongue. So if you have damage to the glossopharyngeal nerves, uh, it impairs swallowing, it also can impair taste. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve. This is the only one that extends beyond the head and neck. It has both motor and sensory fibers and it, it's really vast in its expanse because if we look at it here, the motor fibers are gonna help re regulate activities of the heart like heart rate, breathing for lungs, uh, other abdominal vis viscera in a digestive system, uh, and also motor to the muscles of the pharynx and larynx. Now the sensory portion of the vagus nerve is gonna carry impulses to abdominal viscera. It's gonna uh, have sensory impulses to baroreceptors, that's pressure receptors, and uh, to, help you know, to help sense blood pressure. Chemoreceptors for respiration Right, sensing uh, PCO2 and PO2, which is the concentrations of O2. P stands for partial pressure, but it has to do with concentrations of those chemicals or gases. And then also sensory uh, to the taste buds of the epiglottis and pharynx. Cranial nerve 10 paralysis or vagal nerve paralysis leads to uh, a number of things, but some of the things that we would list is hoarseness and loss of voice, difficulty swallowing, impaired digestion, irregular heart rate. It doesn't have it up here, but difficulty breathing. Uh, and then uh, if we had total destruction of the vagus nerve, it would lead to death. You can see from this picture the many organs that the vagus nerve actually interacts with and affects. Okay, cranial nerves 11, the accessory nerves. They come from the rootlets of C1 through 5, so they actually come from the spinal cord, not the brain, and then they pass through the foramen magnum. Um, and these are motor and they innervate the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid. And it actually, they, they supply those muscles and as well as the C2 cervical nerves supply those muscles as well. Now damage to the spinal accessory nerve would affect those muscles. So raising the shoulders uh, would be a problem because the trapezius raises the shoulders, like a shoulder shrug. And also um, you, um, if you paralyze the the, the SCM, right, so this nerve gets damaged and it affects the sternocleidomastoid, then uh, it causes your head to turn to one side. In fact, the SCM, when I turn my head to the left, it's the right SCM contracting, okay? So it causes the, the head to turn to the same side because there's weakness or paralysis of that muscle. So take a look here. You can see where the, or, you know, the origin of this nerve comes from, the rootlets of C1 through 5 and how it passes up through the foramen magnum and then comes back out of the uh, jugular foramen there to go to the uh, trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. Our last cranial nerve pair is cranial nerve 12. It's the hypoglossal nerve or nerves and they are motor. They're gonna innervate the in extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. The extrinsic is, are the ones that move the tongue globally and the intrinsic change the shape of the tongue. And of course that contributes to both speech and swallowing. So the hypoglossal nerves supply 
those muscles. Let's talk about spinal nerves. We've got 31 pairs of spinal nerves, which we've mentioned this before. You also need to know how many per group. So eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal nerve. Now, the only difference between this and the vertebrae that we talked about before, well, the sacrum has five segments, so we knew that, so there's gonna be five nerves there. The coccyx has, coccyx has three to five segments, but it only has one nerve. And then one really key difference that I want you to hone in on, because it can get confusing, there's seven cervicals, but there's eight cervical nerves. So when you look at this, what happens is the nerves exit above the vertebral body, uh, starting at, uh, well, C1 doesn't have a vertebral body, but starting at C2, it, they're, the, the nerves are exiting above the body. And then when we get to C7, it exits above C7's body, and there's an additional nerve, C8, that exits below C7's body. And then all of the nerves after that exit below the body. So even if that doesn't make sense to you, I'd have to show you it like visually, but even if that doesn't make sense, understand there's eight cervical nerves, even though there's only seven cervical vertebrae. Now when we're talking about spinal nerves, we've got roots. We have the ventral roots and the dorsal roots. And I think I briefly mentioned this in the last chapter, that the uh, ventral roots are motor, so they are efferent fibers that come from the ventral horn, uh, horn motor neurons of the spinal cord. And the dorsal roots uh, contain sensory, which are afferent fibers. And then of course when they come together, they make a mixed spinal nerve that has both sensory and motor. So here's a picture uh, looking at the spinal cord and the ventral and dorsal roots and even the dorsal root ganglion. Remember, ganglion is a collection of nerve cell bodies or neuron cell bodies. And so um, what I did was I put the uh, dorsal in red and the, uh, the ventral in blue just to make it a little easier to see. Now, what are rami? Well, when we have the, the ventral root and dorsal root come together to make the mixed spinal nerve, the mixed spinal nerve is going to branch, and when it branches, it's gonna branch into what's called rami. So ramus just means branch, rami is plural. And so we're gonna have a dorsal ramus and ventral ramus, and let's look at uh, what those are gonna make up. All of the ventral rami, except for T2 through T12, are gonna form plexuses. We're gonna have a cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexus, and we'll go over each of those in just a couple minutes here. Um, the back is innervated by the dorsal rami, and then that ventral rami T2 through 12 goes to the inter it um, serves as intercostal nerves or become intercostal nerves, okay? And they supply muscles uh, between the ribs, so your intercostals, uh, the anterior lateral thorax, and the abdominal wall as well. So that's T2 through T12. Remember, all the other ventral rami are going to form plexuses, which are networks. Of nerves. This just gives you a visualization. I put the dorsal in blue and I put the, um, the ventral in red just so you can see. Now let's talk about some of the plexuses. So uh, C1 through C4 and I want you to know all of the numbers on this. So I want you to know what uh, nerves make up what plexuses. So C1 through C4 make up the cervical plexus. It's going to innervate skin uh, and muscles of the neck, ear, head, and shoulders. And then also the phrenic nerve will be part of this plexus and that supplies the diaphragm. And it actually has fibers from C3 uh, to C5. So C3, 4, and 5 make up the phrenic nerve. So 5 kind of moves into the brachial plexus and we'll talk about that next. The brachial plexus is C5 through T1. So C5, 6, 7, and 8, don't forget there's eight cervical nerves, and T1. Those uh, five nerves, so five, six, seven, eight, and T1, those five nerves, pairs of nerves, um, make up the brachial plexus, which supply the entire arm, hand, and shoulder. I won't hold you responsible for the branches of the brachial plexus as we branch off there, uh, but you can see some of the nerves that they make with the radial, median, ulnar, musculocutaneous, and axillary. This talks about each of those nerves, and you can read through this. Um, just remember axillary, we're thinking like armpit, so you can see things like it goes to the deltoid, teres minor, shoulder, uh, joint capsule. Um, musculocutaneous is biceps, brachialis, part of the forearm. And then you got the median nerve, which we're going to talk about because the median nerve is where we can get carpal tunnel down at the wrist. Ulnar on the ulnar side, radial on the radial side. So I don't really want you to memorize through all this, but realize these are branches from that brachial plexus, from that C5 through T1.
This is just another picture showing you the brachial plexus and the branches coming down so you can kind of visualize ulnar on the ulnar side, uh, median coming through the center of the wrist if you look down at the wrist there, the radial on the radial side. So what is carpal tunnel syndrome? It's impingement of the median nerve and there's a number of ways this can happen. You have this uh, tendon-like band called a retinaculum, it's called a flexor retinaculum, that covers uh, the anterior portion of the wrist. And uh, I'll show you a picture of it in just a second here. And if that gets tight, it can compress the median nerve because the median nerve runs through the carpal tunnel. So it's basically a tunnel made by carpal bones. Another thing is the lunate sits behind or posterior to the median nerve. So if it moves anteriorly, it can compress the median nerve. So if it misaligns, that's another cause. Uh, if the tendon's in there, we have all these flexor tendons that run underneath that sheath. If they become inflamed from overuse or whatever it is, uh, then that will actually swell and cause, you know, the tunnel to get smaller and again compress the median nerve. Um, also, another thing to think about is because the median nerve comes from the cervical or the brachial plexus, so the cervical C5 through T1, uh, then we have to make sure there's no compression of the actual nerve roots that are causing that pain down the arm and into the wrist. Okay, so you can see in red, I pointed to the uh, flexor retinaculum. And that's where you can see it laying over the median nerve there um, and over the carpal tunnel. All right, so the lumbar plexus is L1 through L5. It's going to innervate the thigh, abdominal wall, and the psoas muscle. We talked a lot about the psoas muscle in the um, chapter uh, 10. And I won't hold responsible for some of the branches there, the femoral nerve and obturator nerve, but those are branches of the lumbar plexus. The sacral plexus is L4 through S4. And uh, a part of that is going to be the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve, and I want you to know this, this is really important, is made up of L4 through S3. So L4, 5, S1, 2, and 3. Also know that the sciatic nerve is the longest and thickest nerve in the body, and it supplies the entire posterior of the leg and thigh. And so even like when you look at the tibial and common fibular branches, those are branches of the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve is really supplying the entire posterior of the leg. And so when someone has sciatica, Right? It's pain down the back of the leg, could be in the glute, could be all anywhere, anywhere in that posterior aspect of the thigh and or leg. And uh, we did talk about the piriformis. When it gets tight, uh, it can actually, because it lays over the sciatic nerve, it can actually compress the sciatic nerve. Also, if you have misalignment or impingement of the nerves of L4, S1, 2, or 3, L4, sorry, L4, 5, S1, 2, and 3, any of those could also cause sciatica because those are the branches that make up the sciatic nerve, so it should make sense. Okay, so what is a dermatome? Well, derm thinks skin. So a dermatome is an area of skin that's innervated by branches of a single spinal nerve, and all of the spinal nerves have dermatomes except for C1. And we're gonna look at some of the dermatomes in just a moment here, okay? Now, another thing to understand about dermatomes is they overlap, so if, if one spinal nerve got destroyed or damaged, it would not cause complete numbness of that area. This is a dermatome chart, so you can see the spinal nerves and the areas they supply. And again, we use something like this to check sensation of this on the skin. This is a close-up view of the arm, showing you the brachial plexus and the dermatomes that it supplies. Okay, so Hilton's Law says this. Any nerve that serves a muscle that produces movement in a joint also innervates the joint and the skin over the joint. So if we have a dermatome that's over the biceps, right, that sensation of the biceps, so C5, the C5 also controls the muscle underneath, which is the biceps. And so that's what that's saying. Now we've got reflexes. We have inborn reflexes called intrinsic reflexes. These are rapid, involuntary uh, motor responses to a stimulus. We also have acquired reflexes, which are called learned reflexes, and that's from practice or repetition, things like driving, um, martial arts, things like that can be examples of uh, learned reflexes. Now we've talked about the reflex arc before. We said there's a receptor that picks up the stimulus, a sensory or afferent neuron, an integration center, okay, which is going to be in the spinal cord, the motor neuron that sends out the, to, you know, the, the response uh, or, you know, the action to the effector, and then uh, the effector itself, which is going to be a, a muscle or a gland. You know, we saw it, I think, with a muscle before, but it could be a muscle or a gland. So this shows you the five components, again, of the reflex arc, and so you can visualize those five here. So when we look at spinal reflexes, or spinal somatic reflexes, 
The integration center, as we've mentioned a couple of times, is in the spinal cord, so it doesn't go up to the brain. It goes to the spinal cord and then goes out. And the effector, which is essentially the target that the spinal cord is sending the, the, the response to, like what do we do, is a skeletal muscle. Okay, so when we do something like a knee jerk reflex, that's gonna be an example of a spinal somatic reflex. Now before we get to the example of like a knee jerk reflex, uh, we wanna look at a couple things here. We talked about Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles earlier in the chapter. Well, muscle spindle, spindles are gonna inform the nervous system of the length of a muscle, so what do they get stimulated by? They get stimulated by stretch of the muscle, okay? And what do they do when you stretch the muscle, what happens? It causes contraction of that muscle. So the stimulus for the muscle spindle is stretch of the muscle. The response of the muscle spindle is to cause the muscle to contract, okay? Now the Golgi tendon organ, the, the, the stimulus for that is stretch of the tendon. Now stretch of the tendon is, at, is gonna cause a response of the Golgi ten, tendon organ. And the response is going to be inhibition of muscle contraction while activating the antagonist of that muscle that does the opposite action at the same time. So we're gonna look at an example of this. So when we're looking at these stretch reflexes, okay, remember, um, we're gonna stretch a muscle spindle, it's gonna cause the muscle to contract, okay? So if you, if you read here, muscle contraction in response to increased muscle length, which is stretch, right? So I stretch, I activate the muscle spindle, that causes the muscle to contract. At the same time, you're gonna have reciprocal inhibition. What that's doing is it's activating the, uh, the, the main, the prime mover, and it's inactivating or inhibiting the antagonist, okay? Again, this is a great example of the patellar reflex, also known as the re, uh, knee-jerk reflex. What's going to happen, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna explain it on the next slide so we can visualize it. So what's happening here is we're taking our reflex hammer and we are taking it and hitting the, the um, patellar ligament which is going to pull on the patella, which is attached to the patella tendon, which is going to stretch the quadriceps muscle. Well, that's gonna activate muscle spindles. So what's going to happen? So you see that input going in, right? You see it going into the spinal cord. And then the output, right? And that's, I believe that's, what is that? Uh, we've got this pink going into the spinal cord. That's the input. You've got the blue coming out of the spinal cord. That's the going to the effector, which is the quadriceps. And what's going to happen? Well, we said if we activate a muscle spindle, that it's going to cause contraction of the muscle. So we contract the quadriceps and it extends the leg at the knee, right? So you get this little kicking motion. At the same time, look at the purple. At the same time, we are actually inhibiting the antagonist, which is the hamstrings, right? The hamstrings are going to flex the leg on the knee, the quadriceps extend the leg on the knee, so we're gonna inhibit the antagonist of the quadriceps, which is the hamstrings in this instance. Now, Golgi tendon reflexes, these are designed to prevent damage due to excessive stretch, right? So we don't want to overstretch, otherwise we tear things. And so the, um, what's going to happen is when you activate the Golgi tendon organ, we said it's stretch of a tendon, right? So as we stretch that tendon, by the way, contraction of a muscle is what's going to, what's going to stretch the tendon. And so as we contract the muscle, it pulls on the tendon and stretches it. And then if it stretches to a certain point, we activate the Golgi tendon organ, which is going to cause relaxation of that muscle. At the same time, it's gonna do reciprocal activation, which is the opposite of reciprocal inhibition. It's going to activate the antagonist in this case. So you can see on this picture, if we, we strongly contract the quadriceps, we're gonna stretch the tendon, activating the Golgi tendon organ, what's that gonna do? It's gonna cause inhibition of the quadriceps and activation of the hamstrings. All right, so there's some other reflexes we'll cover. The flexor reflex, also called the withdrawal reflex. This one's pretty straightforward. It's initiated by a pain stimulus and it's just an automatic withdrawal drawl from whatever that pain is. Crossed extensor reflex. So this, what happens here is um, you have the stimulated side uh, is withdrawn or flexed and the opposite side or the contralateral side gets extended. So a couple of examples. Someone grabs your arm, you pull that arm away and you push with the other arm. Another example, if you were to step, let's say with my right foot, I step on glass with my right foot, I lift my right foot and I extend uh, my, my left leg, or I lift my right leg, I should say, and I extend my left leg. So that's a crossed extensor reflex. This picture could be a little confusing, but basically it's the example of grabbing the arm. So you're pulling away with the arm or withdrawing it and you're pushing or extending with the other arm. So that arm on the right is the other arm. 
And so that's what you're seeing here. All right, the plantar reflex. Uh, if you stroke the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot, the toes should flex. So you get, you get a downward flexion of the toes. And if you do not, well, this is a test for corticospinal tracts. And if you do not get that, then it could be damage to corticospinal tracts. So you should have that happen, at least in an adult. Now, in an infant, this would be different. If you stroke the lateral aspect of the foot, you're going to have, uh, this is about up to one years old, right around there. You're going to have dorsiflexion of the big toe, which is the hallux, and you're gonna have fanning of the other toes. This is called Babinski sign. Now this is normal in an infant, but it is not normal in an adult, so if you see this in an adult, it could indicate corticospinal damage or motor cortex damage. All right, our last slide, the abdominal reflexes. This uh, causes contraction of the abdominal muscles and movement of your belly button, right, your umbilicus, in response to stroking of the skin. And if, if these reflexes are absent, um, then again, it could be corticospinal tract damage.